Thank you for coming out. Our book is about when pers prospective students start their college search process, many equate institutional quality with admission selectivity, meaning Harvard is the hardest to get into, so therefore it must be the best. And while there are a lot of selective schools that are excellent, sometimes some of the best academic programs are found at schools that are less selective um, in, in, in the admissions office, but it doesn't diminish their quality in any way. Um, we believe it's much, more, it's much more positive and affirming to explore your options and then figure out what it takes to get there. So identifying what you like, be it academically or personally, and then finding the schools and then looking at the admissions uh, statistics and what are your chances, it really leads to a more positive experience. Over the years, we have seen students who thought they had to get X or Y and they ended up at the place and it did, wasn't a good match. And maybe they're, they're, they didn't think enough about their interests. They thought more about a destination place. And then they get there and they realized, well, academically, it doesn't really have this program I'm interested in, whether it's engineering and you didn't start out at a school that had engineering or you thought you were interested in architecture, but you chose a school that maybe was a good pre-architecture school, but it didn't have a professional architecture program. So we think the best way to organize your college search is a combination of what is it you're interested in, and then look at the colleges and universities, who has those options, would these seem like great fits for me? And then, of course, think about can I get in? So you heard in the introduction about the myth of scarcity. That's where we say, and we've encountered this a lot. Okay, there's only 35 or 40 really good schools, and if I can't get into one of those, well, then what, is it worth it? And we think that's really silly because, first of all, there's more than 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. I think, you know, having many, many years of experience that there's hundreds of really good places. And as Janet said, some admit 6%, like Stanford and Yale and Harvard, and some admit 75%. And in that 75 to 100% could be some really great programs where those students are every bit as happy, if not much happier, they studied at those institutions than someone who went to a five or six percent acceptance school. Well, and, and just also to add, I, I work with kids from all over the country as an independent counselor, and it's very interesting because at one person's high school, there might be 15 or 20 schools that are considered sort of good schools. And it's hard for people to break past that, but then, this, the 15 or 20 schools at, an, at another high school in another part of the country, it'll be different. So like one school makes it on the good list at a high school in Oregon, but at a high school in Connecticut, it's not on the radar. And, and so it's just sometimes people's perceptions are so, it just, their universe is, is kind of small when they're starting out looking at schools. And, and so sometimes you do know of good colleges, but you just don't know that there are, are more <laughs> beyond that. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of um, research shows that most students end up going to college within 250 miles from home. On the other hand, there are students who are really adventurous and want to look at options in other countries. Canada is not that far away from here, and they're all English-speaking campuses even in Montreal, with, with maybe the exception of the University of Montreal and Laval University. And they are a lot less expensive, especially when the American dollar is as favorable as it has been. There's more and more options in other parts of the world, including some universities in Asia that have English-speaking programs. And um, schools have become much more aggressive about coming over to the United States. And of course, I think one place that became really well known was the University of St. Andrews when uh, Prince William went there and met his uh, 
future wife there. And so that's become popular over the last 20 years with American students. And actually to the point where in our book we talk about, well, how do you apply to these schools? How is it different than applying to American colleges? And sometimes there, there's a different process for sure. But other times, like St. Andrews, they're very American friendly. And so they might kind of streamline it and their process for you to apply is, uses all the same stuff that you're doing to apply to domestic schools, like your SAT score, your transcript. So sometimes it's it's not that hard. It's just, it can seem daunting, um, but once you know, oh, this is what I have to do, it, it, it really opens up a lot more options. Right, whereas with Oxford and Cambridge, there's a very different prescribed mm -hmm. path that is well known to the uh, Great Britain students, but it's a little challenging for an American student to show up in their guidance office as a senior and say, I really want to go to Oxford or Cambridge. And unfortunately, you find out, well, there's things you, you should have been doing. Yeah. And it's better if that's something you're thinking about to know that and to start investigating that as a sophomore or a junior, because that's one case where the admissions process is quite different. And in our book, we go into some of those kinds of explanations. So here's what, you know, kind of what we've said already uh, with a little more detail. We think a great strategy is think about your academic and career interests. Think about then your extracurricular interests, things you like to do when you're not in a student. Then, of course, your, uh, what kind of campus would you prefer? What kind of campus environment? What kind of location? What kind of size? And then any other particular personal needs you have, such as some students love horses and have a horse, and they would like to bring their horse or go to a school with horses. And in fact, there's a whole chapter in our book on equine studies and uh, equestrian and polo, and it's, it's a chapter for people who love horses. Well, and, um, and that's great, too, because sometimes people do freeze up. Like, they don't know what they want to do as a job or as a major, and then that's very normal, and that's okay. When you do know, you know, it, it's that that's great, too. But if you don't know, you can usually identify at least one thing that you enjoy in your life. And, you know, and, and then you can be like, well, how's that going to translate to my life at college? And that can be a great way to, to kind of weed through so many choices. Well, and so many people who've been to college will say where they ended up either in terms of their career was a combination of what they studied and some of the things they did outside of the classroom. Um, so what we did following this organizing principle of thinking about what you'd like to study is we broke down the book by particular areas such as a chapter on tech schools and engineering and computer science, performing arts, such as musical theater, music, you know, what music schools are really good for jazz, for example, uh, what places are really good for dance. For example, most people wouldn't uh, know, and we really didn't until a few years ago, that if you were looking for dance, uh, Two of the best places are the University of Utah mm -hmm. and Texas Christian University well, in Dallas. Well, specifically for ballet. And the third would be Indiana University. Right. And, um, and so it's, like, it's just a world where if you're into ballet and you think you want to go to college um, as opposed to going straight to a dance company, those would be your Harvards. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're wonderful programs. And, and all three of those are schools that have very high admit rates in general. Um, ballet is a little mm -hmm. different in that they tend to be audition based, but the idea being that you can find some of the best programs in the world at a place that has a 70% admit rate sometimes. Right, and then there's always students who are thinking about early entry to medical school, dental school. How do I get into, pharmacy schools, do I have to apply when I'm a college student or can I get in from high school? And we break all that down in a chapter on the health sciences programs, as well as the whole changing nursing field, which is uh, very much focused now on bachelor's degrees and higher. Um, then there's other specialties you might not think about, like aviation, uh, music business, sports administration, um, 
our favorite one called Packaging yes. Science, Building a Better Snack Food Bag, where um, people who major in that have no trouble getting jobs and they get very nice salaries. So just some examples. Well, and then also, like, just heading back up to environmental programs, sometimes you know, you you, th you think, oh, in general, yes, I like the earth, I want to study more. But we really like to go in deep and show you, well, what school has a salmon hatchery versus what school has, you know, maybe their strength is in astronomy and, and you know, or, or air pollution. And so you can really see that some schools have some amazing resources and programs that you might not know unless you, you dig in deeper and, and mm -hmm. do some research. And then there's, um, right nearby, we've got the Coast Guard Academy, one of the service academies, and the admissions process is different for the service academies. Uh, we break that down as well as for ROTC programs. Um, then there's some um, military programs that are at public universities, such as the Citadel in South Carolina, Virginia Military Institute, or even cadet programs at colleges that are public universities like Texas A&M and Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Um, so again, one of the things that is a takeaway from our book and from what we're trying to present is that the admissions process will vary somewhat based on what you're interested in. Different process for service academies, different process for art schools and architecture programs, music, theater, honors programs, um, they, they will, it's not all just the common application and your grades and your transcripts and your test scores. And, and also there's, there's the intensity level. And, and this is where admissions requirements can vary. If you might want to be an architect, you, know, you might apply to a, a school that has architectural studies and get a get a BA or a BS in architectural studies. If you know you want to be an architect, you might want to get a B Arch, which is a much more specialized program. Uh, Five-year degree program. And there's not a ton of those choices. And in the Northeast, you've got good ones. Um, Syracuse, Cornell. Um, you have some art schools like um, Rhode Island School of Design and the Pratt Institute. Um, but there is a big difference between having the Bachelor of Architecture where you can then sit for your licensure exam and go out and be an architect versus you majored in architectural studies, but to be a professional architect, you're going to need to get a master's degree in architecture. And both are good choices. I mean, sometimes when you're 17, you kind of like architecture and you want to find, find out more about it before you commit. And then other times you have a kid who was like obsessed with Legos by the time they were two and they know. And you know, and, and, that, and that's good that there's options for both types of students and you can ultimately get to this, the same end game with the same level of success, but just in a different way and a different pace. So, okay, so there, there are two schools that we're thinking of that have the unique um, distinction of being excellent in business, communications, music, musical theater, theater, and marine biology. So it's so there, and, there's, not just one or right, two or three, they're, they're all of these. They're considered premier programs with this particular assortment. Do you guys have any idea? It's, it's okay, we're just, nope. UConn has some of these things. Yeah, I mean, UConn is a, is a terrific school. But to have this sort of unique mix of musical theater Where we'd have and like top biology, 25. Yeah. programs, if not top five programs in each of these. And UConn collectively, because of Avery Point, would have marine biology, but stores alone wouldn't. Yeah, this would be on, on one campus. So Paul, so do you want to give it up to, for the crowd? They are Boston University and the University of Miami. Um, okay, so the second one, an art school whose graduates are sought after by Apple, CNN, Disney, ESPN, LucasArts, Universal Studios, and more. So this is a great response to your parents if you're an art-interested student, and they say, and oh, art you're never school? going to get a job. You're, you're going to be an unemployed art school grad. And yeah. in fact, <laughs> this, there's several art schools that have 
highly sought after graduates. This is one that almost no one would guess. And as an aside, it is also supposedly one of the most haunted college campuses in America. So it's named for a circus. A circus that has famous circus Connecticut person. roots, I think. That's Barnum. Oh, okay. Maybe it does. It's called it's the Ringling Oh, that's not the College same. of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. So, but anyways. So, and these students yeah, it get he, recruited by all these great companies because of, especially with their animation programs and their other, their digital art and design programs. And I mean, there's a lot of great art schools out there, which, um, I mean, there's a lot of great schools that you go to, even if they don't have massive recruiting fairs, but, uh, but there are a lot of art schools where people recognize the quality coming out of them. Uh, well, Rhode Island School of Design is a good yeah. example. Their graduates do well. Okay, so in the Ivy League, there's famous business schools for like Harvard MBA. But we're talking here about undergraduate major in the Ivy League. And a hint is somebody who's very famous all of a sudden. Well, he was famous. Now he's even more famous has a degree from this school, one of the two Ivy League undergraduate business programs. Yep, Penn, exactly. Wharton. University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business. And then hidden in one of the New York State colleges at Cornell, the Agricultural College, is a business program of the Dyson School of Business. Um, and then there's programs at Columbia and Brown universities that are sort of like business programs, but they're not full on business programs yeah. like at Cornell and um, University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so the top program in ceramic and glass art and engineering. And um, for state residents, they pay in state. Mm hmm, that's right. It's in tiny Alfred, New York. It's actually Alfred University, a college of about 2,000 students, where it's a private college for most of it, but New York State has a special program in ceramic and glass art and engineering, where if you're from New York, you would pay the state tuition. And it's the top program in the world like with the packaging engineering example. These people get jobs. Employers yeah. are looking for these students. And um, those of you, you might be familiar with Corning Glass. Um, Corning it's nearby. Glass is, is right nearby and has a big connection to that program. Now you know the answer to five. I can't even remember that one. Um, okay, where can you fuse fine art and biology into medical illustration major? Yes, I do know that one. And that, it will surprise you. It is in America's heartland. Um, it is Iowa State. Iowa State uh, has, uh, Iowa State is an, a pretty amazing place. Um, and has some great programs. And it's, it's really wonderful because a lot of science people who are also artsy people sometimes feel like they, ha you know, they, they have to choose. And, and that's a wonderful major and a great example of combining two passions. And Iowa State is not an easy school, but it accepts more than half of its applicants. And Actually, it a lot more than half. Probably 75%. Yeah. And um, they have very good programs, leading programs in landscape architecture mm -hmm. and a really great uh, graphic and design program as well. Um, okay, so then number six offers only undergraduate degree in U.S. in art preservation. University of Delaware. Yeah. So um, So if you're interested in paintings and preserving art conservation, paintings, discovering that maybe Picasso painted over um, the original, then uh, you might be interested in this. And it's a field that um, combines chemistry and the arts. And it's, and it's interesting because Delaware is home to DuPont, uh, DuPont Chemicals. And the DuPonts, as, as a family and foundation, 
have been very invested in historical preservation, and they turned to the University of Delaware to be kind of the epicenter for that. Uh, there are graduate programs. There's actually four graduate programs in, in historical art preservation. Um, but if you can do it as an undergrad, you're all the more prepared to go on to graduate school. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. And again, Delaware is a school that has a pretty healthy admit rate. Uh, it's not super easy to get in, but at the same time, they're looking for kids. And for it's sure. a popular public choice for East Coast students. I know when we lived in New York, a lot of students would go to Delaware. So here's some other areas that we focus on in the book, um, such as uh, if you're in U of LD, um, you know, learning differences, and there's good programs, there's specialized colleges like Landmark and Beacon, but there's also many institutions that have very good programs for you. For homeschooled students, we tackle the whole process, and that's becoming, I think it's becoming more common for students to present a lot of community college work or credit or even finish high school through community college. And then transfer admission whether it's from a community college start or you didn't really make the, the best choice the first time you thought you did, but you showed up and after a few months you realize this isn't really what I want. <clears throat> There's no uh, shame in that. In fact, almost half of the students who graduate every year are graduating from a college where they didn't start. And then we also talk about financial aid um, and financing college. The book the focus of the book is more on academic programs, but we do realize that that's such an integral part of your decision making and learning about schools. So we talk about the ins and outs of financial aid and merit scholarships uh, and colleges that offer full scholarship opportunities. We, we mention certain schools where it, they're either tuition free or um, they're heavily subsidized. So going there is much less expensive than even going to you know, your local in-state university. Uh, we mentioned places like Webb Institute in New York. It's very mm -hmm. specialized. Webb it, Institute of Naval Architecture. So if yeah. that's your thing, those people are highly, highly employable after graduation. It's a small school. They get a lot of attention, but they have to really, you have to really know that that's what you want to focus on. Yeah, and the few free colleges outside of the um, service, federal service academies are very specialized places like the Webb Institute of Naval mm -hmm. Architecture with fewer than 200 students and a very specialized curriculum. Uh, there's yeah. this place in um, uh, on the border of Nevada and California called Deep Springs College where you live on a ranch and it's still all male. They, they had a lawsuit to uh, they wanted to go co-ed, and there's like 26 students. They read the great books. They work on a ranch, and it's free. But that one is also different in that, unlike Webb, where the major is very specialized, and you know, in terms of your future, uh, Deep Springs is interesting in that it is a two-year program. It's a liberal arts, and college. it's a, it's more of a holistic liberal arts program. It's it's really intense, but a good intense, and uh, those students tend to transfer to really anywhere they want after doing the Deep Springs experience. Mm -hmm. And so, as we've said, <clears throat> bottom line is we think selectivity is less important than your interests, and we think the better informed you are about your options, the more likely you are to have a great list of places that you're very excited about. And if that's the case, no matter where you get in, you're bound to end up with choices that you're happy about. So we, we also know that everyone wants to know what really matters to admission committees. And, and that, that can vary depending on the school. Uh, it really depends on the, their selectivity. And uh, grades and test scores, but particularly grades, are still the most important thing. There, there are a lot of test optional schools, and there are schools that do take a more holistic approach, including with grades. But at the at the end of the day, like you really, the grades and how you do in high school really, really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then just think of any public university process where they tend to be a little more transparent. 
where you can sometimes go to the website and it'll give you a guide as to here are the courses and the, the credits you should have earned in these areas. And then sometimes it'll be as explicit as here's what your average GPA and test score should be. And it's um, also good to know that sometimes when you're looking at out of state public universities, the grade score matrix that they use for their residents is going to quite possibly be different than the matrix you would need as an out-of-state resident. Yeah, just assume it's harder. Um, and so um, obviously here's what we have seen over the years where I've worked, where Janet's worked, with all the, the, the cases of students she's worked with. Uh, transcripts always the most important. And uh, I've, we've seen hundreds of presentations about college by places where we haven't worked and, and then with the places we've worked and they always say the transcript. Standardized yeah. test, if required, generally will be number two. Um, and I, when I worked at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, it's a specialized place with science and math programs for the most part. <clears throat> Every piece of research we found when we would sort of do like a post-mortem on who made it and who didn't would be the transcripts and the test scores were the best predictors. Now that's for them. It's not always the case. I've worked at small liberal arts colleges where some of the students who flunked out had big test scores. Mm -hmm. um, often what we found was there was a variance between their grades and their test scores. But what you can never predict is somebody's lazy. Somebody stops going to class. Somebody plays video games, um, doesn't even leave their room. These things are you can't predict. So that's another reason why campuses, especially the most selective ones, they do this more holistic review where they get beyond the transcript and the test yeah. scores. And that's where oftentimes the essay can be very important. It gives colleges insight into who you are beyond the transcript, beyond your ACT or SAT score. and. Um, it gives them an idea of, well, how are they building a community and do they want you in it? Um, but it's it's helpful to think of the essay as a great story that you can share. And, and it's, good, it's good to entertain your reader if they have hundreds of applications and suddenly you present something that, wow, you know, that, that's memorable. That, that's, really, that's really good. Uh, the other essays, some colleges will require supplemental essays, and sometimes people blow those off because they're like, oh, it, those are shorter. <laughs> but no, but those are actually something you want to pay close attention to because if a school is asking you, why do you want to come to our college, they really want to know. And that's how they gauge yield. Yield is the, likeliness, the, the, the likelihood of you attending the college if they admit you. And so sometimes they'll take a slightly weaker applicant grade and test score wise if the love is there whereas they might turn away a kid who hasn't hasn't really shown them that they really are interested in, in going to the college yeah and so in terms of non-academic all the extracurriculars there really is there's two possible ways you can really impress people one is you've got this depth of commitment in a certain area or two and you've achieved excellence. That's great. Some people think it's all about breadth and most colleges respect depth more than breadth. On the other hand, there are students who are really involved around their high school and they kind of make the place go. And so in that respect, you don't want to penalize that kind of student. I think what colleges are always very um, skeptical about is the student who just joins a bunch of things thinking it'll make their application look stronger and there really isn't much of a commitment to any of one of these activities. So I, we always say don't just join things thinking it looks good, only be involved in the things that really interest you and it's helpful to have achieved some level of strength, expertise, mastery, depth, yeah. so that you have something you could write about in an well, essay. And I actually have two things to add to that. Uh, the exception would be sports. Sports can be an activity where uh -huh. that, you know, the, the phrase, the tail wags the dog, um, that can really change 
an admissions landscape, especially if it's a D1 level sports program where really they can make decisions based on athletic uh, wants and needs. Uh, the, even D3? Well, even D3, absolutely. Um, I mean, I worked at a well-known boarding school and somehow the crew coach at Yale got my phone number and would call me about students who were my counselees and to, to, to talk to me about, you know, their level of interest. And, and lo and behold, these students got accepted to Yale because the crew coach was so interested. Yeah. Uh, it, now, that's a Division One non-scholarship. But even at some of these Division even threes, a D3 like school trying to rebuild a program College or Amherst yeah. or Williams, if the coach is really interested in you, it doesn't guarantee, but it means you're getting a much closer look in the yeah. admissions committee. But people do sometimes freak out and sometimes parents freak out like, oh, you should join some clubs. Hands down, every time, I'd much rather see you get better grades. If you, I mean, like, if you want to join the club and you're passionate about it, you should join the club. But don't feel like you have to, to load on the clubs to have something. I'd much rather see you get in the door with a higher GPA um, than for them to think you're interesting, but they, they can't take you seriously because the GPA is not strong enough for, mm -hmm. for their institutional needs. Teacher and counselor recommendations, always good if your teachers and counselors know you well. Select the teachers that you think know you the best, even if they're not necessarily the ones who gave you all A's, because they can at least, maybe they gave you a B, and only one person got an A in that class. That's really helpful information to convey. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of interviews, <clears throat> the interview is less and less of a factor than it was, say, 25 or 30 years ago, but it still can really matter. And uh, it matter. It tends to matter the smaller the college, mm -hmm. smaller private colleges still tend to, to really value the interview. It's not that bigger colleges don't value it, it's just they have such high application volumes that it's not realistic for them to be able to run a successful interview operation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there are some larger schools. Uh, Stanford, for instance, is a bigger school. They, they, do, they do interview, uh, but it's, it's more, I, would not, I don't want to say marginal, but it, it's, it's, it's less of a part of the application process as it would be at a smaller liberal arts college. Yeah, a good rule of thumb, and it gets into um, the last bullet here, level of interest. Mm -hmm. If you are um, applying to a college or university that's not in um, Boston or someplace that had, with hundreds of campuses where lots and lots of students visit, it's a little out of the way. And um, maybe um, not everybody gets there. And if you're really interested in that school, try to get there. If yes. you can't get there, pay attention to all the information they send you about when they're coming to your area to offer interviews. And they will. And you know, like a great example would be a school like Kenyon College in Ohio. Uh, if you make it from Connecticut to to Kenyon, that that says something. That says that you're really you're making the effort. And when it comes down to it, like we said a few minutes ago, you, you know, you might have a slightly weaker academic profile than another student, but if you're showing them the love and you actually got on an airplane to go see them, uh, that they, they definitely take that into account because it, it also leads to a more engaged student who's likely to, you know, enroll, but also be really grateful and happy to be there. Yeah, and it's a chance for you to make your case. So when I was a dean of admissions at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, we found visiting high schools wasn't as useful because Reed is a one here, one there kind of school. So we would announce through you know emails and such that we're going to be interviewing students in Princeton, New Jersey, or Stamford, Connecticut. And we would hope that the interested students would show up. So when we're looking at applications and there's a close call between student A and student B and student A actually came to our interview at a Starbucks in uh, 
Princeton and the other one lived 20 miles away and didn't show up, well, who do you think we're more likely to admit if we're going to only admit one? And we've yeah. been hearing more and more from private selective colleges that showing interest mm -hmm. makes a difference. Well, and, and, and I actually, two things to follow up on that. With the interviews, oftentimes the person interviewing you is kind of, is winds up being the person who represents the territory of you know uh, for the, the geographic that yes. leader. Yeah. And so what happens is that person is almost like your lawyer in that they read your file and they if it's not a clear cut decision you might go to a committee where they have to present your case to other people in the office. And if it's it's a wonderful wonderful uh, addition to their advocating for you if, if they've met you and they're like, oh my gosh she was really great we spoke for 45 minutes and mm -hmm. it was it's it's a lot easier to this represent this is the a human person. side of this whole yes. field and i i personally have have encountered that where if there's a if there's a student who just seems like a really good guy i'm gonna i'm gonna advocate all the more to get him admitted even if a committee is a little resistant i'm gonna fight for that kid um, well, and equally, yeah. when you do show up for an interview or you visit or you have interaction with admissions officers, if you're interested, act like it. Mm -hmm. um, people will remember odd and less than positive encounters. Um, and so it's not good to be the student where somebody said, oh, I didn't that like guy. I didn't yeah. like that. Ex and it, yeah. those are rare. They are rare. So we don't think of everybody as being like some inspector general who's out there looking for reasons to dislike you. But it's just remembering that you are selling yourself yeah. and presentation, enthusiasm, it all matters. Well, and I just one more point too. Sometimes it might not be an interview situation, but it might be an optional essay. Uh, Tulane is a great example where they have an optional essay, and uh, you better do it. You know, because it shows you care. It shows you're engaged. Uh, obviously, if you don't care that much about going to the school and it's just sort of a one-off that you're applying, then you can decide is it worth your time. But if it's Generally speaking, if you care enough to apply, it is worth it to do that extra level of engagement that they're asking for. Well, and that's a bridge to the whole page here on the essay. And so we decided, you know, we're going to give you a lot of detail about this because say you're in a 5 to 10 percent or 20 percent acceptance rate school. You know, the Yales, the Stanfords, the um, Vanderbilts. Everything has to be strong. And so if everything is strong, everybody's got great grades, has good enough test scores, nice teacher has accomplished things, yeah. great teacher recommendations, how do you then come alive from that less than, you know, fully dimensional transcript and test scores? Well, so you've already made it through the this. initial gate. They yeah. haven't rejected you on your GPA alone. Right. They, they like you and they want to keep moving you forward. And you heard Janet mention there's there's usually more than one type of essay. This essay, mm -hmm. the, the optional, or there's, there's, the, there's the essay you have on a common application where it's like write about and they give you three or four prompts. There, there's different prompts and it t tends to be up to 650 words and it's more of a general statement. And the prompts, while they're, they're definitely distinctively different, uh, you can usually bend your life story to fit one of the prompts. Uh, they're not so specific in that, in that sense. Yeah, and so you think about this as you think about any writing assignment where, first all, of all, the, the most basic is, can you write? And how well can you write? Can you gauge, can, can you convey what it is you're trying to convey? In, in a way that suggests you're more than literate. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's more or less about how do you tell a story and what is that story? And so think of this as more like a journalistic way of writing rather than some academic way of writing. It's so, so many times at school you have the essay where you have to have this very structured intro where you have your thesis statement and then you're like, and then I will tell you this and that. 
There's Furthermore, no thesis statement in this so essay. You, sometimes, so, but sometimes you have to start your college essay. If that's the way you're comfortable writing, it's okay to start it like that. But then you ultimately, you're better off cutting that out and just getting right into the, into the excitement of it all. Yeah, when I used to teach college essay writing for, with students in a summer course, I would often just cross out the first paragraph because the student hadn't realized that where it got interesting was usually in the second or third paragraph. And I'd say, this is the beginning of your essay. And Janet finds this is it generally all true. all the time, yeah. And so obviously, you know, proofreading, structure, clarity, but sometimes it's okay to, that first draft, rather than freezing up, sometimes it's better to just get it out there however you want and then head back and work on like we like we were saying editing out things for clarity getting to the point um, but the one thing to keep in mind from the beginning is is showing more than you tell sometimes have you ever heard your teacher say show don't tell it's almost like a cliche yeah, show it, don't tell it's great when you can actually use these vivid examples rather than describing the event from afar. Um, well, and you know you're telling when you're not writing something that would be easily seen by the reader. You know you're showing when, as Janet said, it's vivid. It's like a word picture. You, you're, you're somewhere in a scene. And yes. again, that's when we look at these essays and say, aha, you've put me in a scene. You've put me in a place. I can, I can see it as the reader versus yeah. you spent your whole time just telling me something rather than I, bringing you know, it alive I want to be me. in the Minnesota woods with your Boy Scout troop where like they have to decide, do they kill the squirrel or don't kill the squirrel? that's mortally wounded. And you know, it's like, I'm not there and I'll never be there. But for that moment, I'm there, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, you mm -hmm. know, and, and as a reader, especially as a reader reading potentially hundreds of applications, whoa, you know, give me a little suspense or maybe not suspense, but just, you know, I wanna know, I wanna know more about this. Yeah, and mystery can be very good, like mystery of what's going on, so I want to figure it out, mm -hmm. versus don't be so mysterious that the reader's like, what was that about when yeah. they get to the end of the essay? Yeah. Um, and then really, like we said, it's, it's, this brings you alive. It helps the committee get to know you better as a person. They can, they can envision you. They can think, think what you might be like if they um, had you as a roommate in college. Um, and in some cases, you might even have students. There's, there are cases where some uh, selected students will get um, the chance to be admissions interviewers and admissions readers. So in fact, there might be a student who's looking at your application going, would I want to have this person in my class with me Those or in my dorm with me? Those people are sometimes the toughest critics yes, on they you are. because, you know, yes. they're, they're, they're they're thinking of you as a, as a peer, and, and there's different criteria is involved. Yeah, and, and write you, not what your mother or father or somebody else thinks you should do. I mean, there was a story years ago, I, it's a true one, where a student wanted to get into an Ivy League school, and she got deferred through the early process, and when her counselor called up and said, well, what happened? This student loves it, and she's so strong, they said, you know, her essay just fell flat and it just, it just, we have a lot of great applicants. And then the counselor said, I can't believe that. Her essay was really vivid and wonderful. And they were like, are we talking about the same essay? And so the counselor faxed the essay that she thought the student had sent. And in fact, the student's essay got sanitized by I think a parent or somebody else who said, no, 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 it's too risky. And when the admissions officer saw the original essay, well, the student ended up getting admitted later on. The, the other thing too is as someone who reads a lot of essays, uh, sometimes like it's, it's very helpful to have editorial feedback, but too many cooks with mm -hmm. too many visions of how the recipe should go can be really, really bad. Because you can have someone. Well, you had one recently. I, yeah, I, every year I, I sometimes will have. The student had written like something that, and all of a sudden, 
friends or maybe the family's yes. like, no, 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 you should write about this. And and it was it was it was almost heartbreaking. I'm like, don't don't lose this fabulous essay. But but where it can get particularly complicated and emotionally loaded is where you might ask five people you really respect who are smart and good writers for advice and they all do have good advice and they all do see a good outcome for your essay but when you ask them all at once those ideas and conflict and it leaves you with this muddled mess yeah and, so and you kind of lose your voice and you don't know like if you take snippets of advice from all five of them you wind up with this weird hodgepodge essay that's not good so it's it's so like i said it's good to seek out advice and it's really good to ha you know have someone you trust who can give you suggestions of okay this is looking good this is where you need to shore things up but too many cooks in the kitchen is a disaster oftentimes with this yeah essay. i would say there's three reasons you want somebody to look at your essay one just for the basic proofreading two would be to make, and this is where it should be somebody who's not as familiar with what you're writing about. Can you follow this? Yeah. Where is there a lack of clarity? And then the third would be if you're writing about something that you're concerned is a little bit risky, mm -hmm. I would say then go to somebody that wouldn't initial, immediately go, no, 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 that's too risky. Go to somebody that you know has your best interests in in you know in mind but also isn't going to be so risk averse that it's just going to be a no start yeah. over yeah it, it it's also good to keep in mind that colleges sometimes will imply like bear your soul to us but oftentimes if you bear your soul too much you could open up a situation where they're worried about liability like is this person stable enough to go to college. Uh, something you're writing about could seem like a tale of triumph, like you got over a, a crisis. And it is a wonderful story, but from an admission standpoint and from a legal standpoint, are you going to have the school be like, oh my gosh, yeah, what if she relapses? How many people can we handle cutting themselves? Is can what we you're handle having about? her in a dorm room, living away from home? Mm -hmm. um, we have to think about the safety of the community. And so suddenly, you you thought you were opening up and sharing something that was so important and and really a very positive thing but it gets read in a way that you never intended and so, so it's something to be you know not paranoid about but to be aware of and so here's another then there's this other essay and it's what i call the tell us how much you love us or know about us essay yes. and sometimes it's there and sometimes a school doesn't have it when they have it it's I mean, this is too, so obvious, but I have to say it. One example, I worked at Boston College in the 90s, and we had a why do you want to go to Boston College essay. And you'd be surprised how many times we heard, well, I'm attracted to the Catholic Jesuit tradition. I want to go to this medium-sized campus near a vibrant major city, and that's why I want to go to Georgetown University. Because mm -hmm. Georgetown and BC have all those things in common. We would get it at Oberlin too. Like some, if I, and especially after I'd had a long day and I get this this application and it says, I really want to go to Vassar. And I'd be like, then go to Vassar. Yeah. Remember, admission officers are people. Yep. And, and some are alumni. Yeah. I can and, tell you. And sometimes you just, you just want to be careful that you don't in some, like just accidentally just set them off. Yeah, you know? I didn't go to Boston College, yeah. so it didn't bother me as much. But I but didn't I go to tell Oberlin. You, but I the knew Boston that, you know, College grads who read that hated those essays. But it was said to me with Oberlin, not having gone to Oberlin, but caring about Oberlin, be like, well, if this person didn't have the time or the thought to delete Vassar and at least replace it with Oberlin, yeah. let alone write yeah. write a new fresh essay yeah. that really spoke to Oberlin. I, I had to think, well, there are other kids who do, who really want to be here. Well, in nine times out of ten, what's the admissions office go? Oh, that's where they really want to go. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've seen that. And in a close call, you could be like, go there then. Well, but you know, and sometimes it really is accidental. I looked at a kid's essay last night and she was really tired and stressed and it wasn't her best essay. I don't think it, it wasn't speaking. She still wanted to go to the school and she still really liked it, but I could tell she patched in a paragraph and 
she didn't bother to change the name of the other school. For and you caught it before some admissions exactly, office. Exactly. It's much better for me to be like, hey, you know, rather than her sending that in. Okay, so now shifting toward what's so important to everybody is, and understandably, can I afford it? And what will it cost? What's out there? And this sort of maze of there's need based aid, there's merit based aid. Well, now the basic facts are there's need-based aid, and generally uh, many colleges, there's only one form you need to fill out, and that's the FAFSA. Now, for others, especially the most selective ones, there's the other form, which is called the college scholarship, college boards form called the profile. Um, deadlines are more important than anything else when it comes to financial aid. If you miss a deadline, you may find yourself, like my brother's son last year applied to one of our SUNY schools from Vermont, and um, when he called me and said, what can you do for him? He didn't get financial aid. I said, well, he missed the deadline. There's nothing I can do for him. And so you don't want to be that student. So if you do get super organized about this process, definitely keep track of all those deadlines and get everything in before the financial aid deadline. So merit scholarships, that, that's a really interesting sort of jungle <laughs> where it can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes there's colleges that have maybe one prestigious scholarship at that school. I, I worked at Skidmore and they had two merit scholarships. One was for music students called the Filene and the other was a science scholarship and they were extremely generous. Um, and they were kind of what you would call a beacon scholarship. Uh, but any other aid was need-based aid. Whereas there's other colleges where they do what's called discounting, which means that sort of across the board, it's pretty likely that you could get at least some merit money. Yes. And it, it yes. really, it really, there's a range. And uh, some once, schools, Yeah, once oh. upon a time, when people would list the percentage of students getting scholarship or, or aid, it was all need-based aid. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that uncommon for a private college especially, not the publics as much, a private college to say 80% to 95% of their students are getting some form of aid. It could be need-based aid, or it could be aid that's like what Janet described, mm -hmm. where they're really trying to entice you to come there so generally, in order to get merit, they're trying to lure you to the school, either because your SAT scores kind of elevate their profile or you have some sort of interesting talent uh, that would really enhance their community. And so merit is a great way to get you more interested you know, in them as opposed to maybe a school that would be widely perceived as higher on the, on the food chain. Yeah, I mean, here's a good comparison. University of Connecticut, UConn, your public flagship, um, relatively inexpensive for state residents, need-based aid, very little merit aid. Mm -hmm. um, Quinnipiac, on the other hand, private university, on the face of it, looks considerably more expensive than University of Connecticut. Difference is almost everybody at Quinnipiac is getting some kind of scholarship to go to Quinnipiac. So you will have students at Quinnipiac who are paying either the same amount or, in some cases, maybe even less than a similar student from maybe the next town over who's going to U the University of Connecticut. And, so, and the, the reason for this, like some, well, why don't public schools give merit money? Or they, some of them do, but I mean, Taxpayers relatively. don't want them doing that, usually. They don't, but also, uh, you, typically state schools tuition is already subsidized. So the cost of educating a student at UConn is more than what you'd actually be paying as an in-state resident. So by having a sort of flat across the board, lower, tuition rate to create greater access, they don't have as much money to, to work with, to do other stuff. And as far as out-of-state universities, uh, there are some, like University of Vermont is an interesting example of a school that- And New Hampshire. That, and New Ham UNH, they're pretty generous with merit. That's unusual. But uh, for instance- Yeah, for example, SUNYs, we 
we're really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Our tuition is about $7,000 for in-state students. And even for out-of-state students, our tuition is relatively competitive with um, in-state at some of nearby. But we offer no merit scholarships to out-of-state students. Well, and what I was saying, though, is is a a place like a a real flagship, like University of Michigan, because there's such demand, they can charge what rivals a private school tuition for for an out-of-state applicant because they know people want to go. On the other hand, Indiana Mm -hmm. is very aggressive about giving scholarship discounts to out-of-state students. So I've known people whose son... Our daughter got into the University of Wisconsin, the University of Michigan, Indiana. No merit or financial aid at Michigan because they didn't qualify for need-based. A little bit from Wisconsin and double from Indiana. And, you know, Indiana's a really great school. I mean, you'd be surprised how many times Indiana shows up in well, our chapters. Well, we mentioned it for ballet just about tonight. About all yeah. these tip-top programs. It's a beautiful campus as a... Uh, uh, one of the most beautiful campuses you'll ever see. Um, yeah. And w- we see Indiana stickers around here in Connecticut. So, you know, they have made it a, a, um, a strategy to try to get more out-of-state students. And then there's states that kind of go back and forth. For years, uh, University of California system, UC, like UC Berkeley, UCLA, uh, they enrolled about 95% California residents. And so to be an out-of-stater and get into a UC, it was like you were like to an unusual purple Harvard. gazelle or something. And, um, and then when the state's finances changed and the way they structured their college funding changed, suddenly they're like, oh, wait, we actually should admit more out-of-state applicants because it helps us pay our bills. And so while it's not easy to get into the UC system, it's easier than it had, it had been mm-hmm. for a generation, it seems. Yeah, and then, of course, there was a backlash against that, so mm-hmm. now they're back to, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so they kind of, the pendulum kind of moves back and forth with a lot of schools. So here's um, our shameless plug for the book. Um, yes. We have it up there. Um, here are all the different th- ways, some of the ways in which it's organized. We had that on our handout. And then um, it's done well. In terms of reviews, uh, Janet, you can see her in a video clip talking about grizzly bears at the University of Montana. They were so excited about that that the University of Montana put it up on their Facebook page. Um, because if you are interested in wildlife biology, it's, it's probably as good as you'll find. Yes, and another and it's school a nice that place. probably admits... I think 80, 85% of their applicants. Um, Missoula is a cool town. It's not a big public university. It's it, like 15,000. You know, it's so for the right kid, if you like to ski, if you're into camping, whatever, it, it could be really a wonderful Trout opportunity. Trout fishing can't get any better than Montana. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. And yeah, and, uh, your library has a copy of our book, but please, if you know anyone who would find it helpful, we have it, or you can order it. Um, it's at Amazon and other Barnes and Noble places like that. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.